was written two days before she was murdered. Where did you find that? In this score, she must have left it here. It's written by somebody called Sergius Bauer. Give it to me. He said I wasn't any liquor. He said I was going out of my mind. You're not going out of your mind. You're slowly and systematically being driven out of your mind. But why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh. wonderful. And oh. you thought I was being cruel to you. <laughs> Keeping no, people away not from cruel. <laughs> making you a prisoner. Oh, you're the kindest man in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I were not mad, I could have helped you. Whatever you had done, I could have pitied and protected you. Because I am mad, I hate you. Because I'm mad, I've betrayed you. And because I am mad, I'm rejoicing in my heart without a shred of pity, without a shred of regret. Watching you go with glory in my heart. Welcome to Movie Umbers. My name is Bob Sham. I'm Angela. And the sounds you hear may be dogs. I just realized I'm wearing my Noir Month outfit. But it'll be in color. That's the only difference. <laughs> Even though this movie is from 1944. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's Women in Crisis. That's the theme we're in uh, right now. Women in Crisis all month long. These women's, man. They're all going crazy. We watch a lot of, we're watching a lot of women lose their minds. In other movies, they seem to really be losing their mind. But in this one, it's it's a goddamn man tricking her into thinking she's losing her mind. Truly did not realize that this is the origin of the term gaslighting. Yes. Initially, it was based on a play called Gaslight by mm-hmm. Patrick Hamilton. Mm-hmm. And there was a British version of this movie that had come out a few years before the one we're talking about today. You can find that online. Yeah. I think it's from 40. But yes, by the time we get to this one, probably the more infamous production of it. I mean, Ingmar Bergman. The 1944 film Gaslight, directed by George Cukor. You're one of those fabulous directors that if you knew, you know. But if you don't, (laughs) you don't. And starring Ingrid Bergman. Oh, Um, I said Ingmar, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> Ingmar, Ingrid. the Swedish director, uh, no, starring Ingrid Bergman, not Ingmar Bergman. No. <laughs> and uh, also starring Char- Charles Boyer, who is actually, you're, you you hate this dude. He's so good in, in this movie. He uh, really is. Also starring Joseph Cotton, who maybe you remember from Citizen Kane, a young, uh, most wood era Angela Lansbury. Wood era? Meaning like when you're like, would you or wouldn't you? Oh. This is wood era. She's like a, she plays like a little saucy little minx here, doesn't she? She's a tartar, ain't she? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, strict lot. I'm not going to sleep in the same room with her. See the way she looked at me? Don't you think perhaps your costume might have something to do with it? You kind of yeah. get the vibe. I think Hayes Code is not going to make her go full ho. Yeah. But you got the vibe that she likes to throw it around. Oh, yeah, bit. definitely. That's right? not a secret. But, yeah, she's she's very interesting in this movie. She plays kind of this so-called uh, low-class British woman. She's a maid. A maid. You're not going to be high class and be a maid, let's be honest. But she's getting a job where they pay her a whopping 16 pounds a year, if you can believe it. Man, that seems even low for 1944. That can't be a full year. Your wages will be 16 pounds a year. Yes, sir. I understand all right, sir. I mean... I don't think you heard that right. The value is different, but it seemed even low for 1944. 16 pounds a year seems unbelievable. 16 pounds a year. Yes, sir. Maybe a week. 16 pounds a year. No. Or a month. No, a week would be decent back then. Maybe a month. Not a year. I swear to God they said year. That's like one... Less than two pounds a month. Well, you know, you get a beer for a penny, right? Yeah, maybe. Something like that. Sure. Gaslight. Yes, the term did come from this story. We meet this young girl whose aunt has just been murdered. And she is being sent away did to you, study music. Did you see her aunt be murdered? 
No. Are you feeling okay? <laughs> Are you sure you're not sick? Did we I don't think I, do I look like I'm ill? I don't feel like I'm ill. We're talking about short circuit too. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what did you think we were talking about? A movie called Gaslight? No, we're talking about short circuit too. <laughs> You've been a little strange lately. You've been a little <laughs> sick. Your brain's been real foggy. Mm, yeah. You lost my dad's war medals. Remember? I don't remember your dad having war medals. He's got a few. Oh, no. He's got a gunner medal. You you threw it off the Woodland Street Bridge. Remember? <laughs> no, that was my phone. I forgive you, but you need to do a little threw better. my phone off the Woodland Street I think Street it's Bridge. best if you don't leave the house ever. What about my job? I'll dress as you and go to your job and, and do it. Probably better than you did because I'm a man. <laughs> okay. It, anyway, anyway <laughs> go on with your fanciful tales. Okay, so my fanciful tale goes as follows. She gets sent away to study music with the same teacher who taught her aunt. Her aunt was a famous singer in operas and she performed in all over the world and so she's going there and she's learning music if we flip forward 10 years she's in a rehearsal and there's a guy playing the piano and she's distracted and listen i don't know whether she was doing a good job or not because the kind of music that she's singing i hate <laughs> To me, it was bad, but I don't know that it was bad. The, you don't like that warble, that classic warble singing? Listen, no. But there's no, there's no heart in it, Bob. But also, <laughs> the teacher pulled her aside at the end and was like, what's going on with you because you're not putting your heart into it? She's and in love. She's in love. And so he basically says to her, she's like, listen, I'm never going to be as good of a singer as my aunt. You're right. My heart's not in it. And he says to her, well, if you have love, you should pursue that because you can't pursue two things if you're a woman. You know, like you have to choose love or a career. Otherwise, I mean, you won't have time. Mm. So he tells her, forget the singing. Go be in love. That's now your job. She goes out the building and meets up with the piano player who is her love, who is older than her. But not crazy older. And he seems very... Your tall, dark, handsome European <clears throat> man. He seems very romantic. Mm. And he says to her, okay, let's get married. And she says, I've only known you for two weeks. I need to go away for a week by myself. She gets on a train and she meets this little woman who talks so much and ends up lives across the street from where she grew up with her aunt. This lady would have a true crime podcast now. It's all about a girl who marries a man. And what do you think? He's got six wives buried in the cellar. That seems a lot. Yes, and I'm only at page 200. So I'm sure there's still more to come. Oh, it's a wonderful book. Oh, it sounds a little gruesome. Uh, yes, well, I'm afraid I enjoy a good murder now and then. My brother always calls me Bloodthirsty Bessie. She On loves the train, her killing. She wants to know what ha She talks about this house not knowing that this girl has any connection to it. And she's talking about how nothing's ever been moved. And they say that she was murdered. And I wish I could get in that house. Like, she's just so, She like happens to live in the same square where her aunt her aunt's apartment where she got killed. Yeah, with. that's what I said. Oh, I did? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but can we get back to talking about Short Circuit 2, please? Okay, okay. I just well, let listen. you have your delusions, but anyway. I'm almost done with this dream I had. The theme this month is robots we'd like to fuck. <laughs> We're talking Ooh, about- Ooh, you want to fuck Johnny 5? Johnny number 5? Why? What? You going to fuck Johnny know. number 4? Anyway, Johnny number 5 starts jacking Steve Gutenberg off. <laughs> And we're glued. Like, we, rewind, we had to rewind this scene multiple times. Okay, you'd rather talk about Gaslight. I would. Go ahead. Okay. The woman sufficiently scares her that she's a woman going to be alone at the lake for a week or however long. As soon as she steps off the train, the man touches her arm. He has followed her, and he says to her, Are you mad that I showed up? And she says, If you hadn't, I would have missed you terribly or something. <sighs> And sure, because she's in love, mm. but he couldn't let her be alone longer than a couple hours on that train ride. Mm. They get married at the lake. They stay there for like a month. 
And then he tells her that he's always wanted to live in London. First, he asks her where she wants to go. And she names a bunch of places. Not London. And he says, I've always wanted to live in London. And she she actually is like, well, I mean, I, do have I a own a house, house in there. London. Oh, and I'd love to live at this specific square. It would be so great. Yeah. And yeah. she says, well, I don't want to deny you that. I love you. And I've always not wanted to go back because I'm afraid. But I'm not afraid with you. I just so happen to be able to facilitate the things that you're requesting. Yeah. So, like, let's go. Yeah. It's fine. They show up. And very quickly... Everything changes. They get into the house and he says to her, like, she kind of gets upset because she's looking at her aunt's things, right? And there's this huge painting of her aunt. Her aunt looks exactly like her. Yeah. She's gorgeous, but looks exactly like her. He says to her, well, listen, let's just board everything up in the attic and then you don't have to see her stuff and we can get our own stuff. And she likes that idea. She also tells a story about a glove in this, like, curio cabinet was signed by someone but she'd given the other glove to an adoring fan, but never would tell her about who the fan was. Yeah, yeah. And you're already realizing that this man knew her aunt. You know, we, it's very obvious. He no, starts playing a song on the piano, and she goes, picked it up. why are you playing that song? And he goes, well, why not? And she's like, well, that was her most favorite famous song. Mm -hmm. She sang it in every concert she ever did. And then she finds this letter. That's talking about, you have to let me see you one more time. I need to see you. And it's signed this name that I can't remember. Where did you find that? In this score, she must have left it there. It was written by somebody called Sergius Bauer. Give it to me. Gregory, what is it? I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to be so violent. It's just that... Why does this letter upset you so? And that is when it really gets bad. It's weird. It's like at first I thought maybe he just wants, maybe he wants to recreate her as her aunt because he loved the aunt. But he's mean enough to her. Like it's not just controlling in like a, I'm going to make you a little doll. He truly is trying to make her think she's insane and not ever letting her leave the house. He'll leave every night. He says he's going to work somewhere else. He can't play his piano in the house. Mm -hmm. He needs quiet. What's quieter than that fucking house? As soon as he leaves, <laughs> she's getting ready for bed every night. And like you said, the gaslight will dim. And she'll say to Angela Lansbury or Elizabeth. Yeah. I think her name's Nancy. Is Nancy Angela Lansbury's is, name? And, and Elizabeth is like half deaf. She's half deaf. So you know she's not going to hear anything anyway. And she can hear footsteps. What is our stuff. main character's name? Paula. Paula. So... Paula notices the gas goes down and she starts hearing sounds and she's asking Nancy, like, did you turn on the gas downstairs? And Nancy's like, no, mom, why would I do that? Like, she's all so sassy. And then Elizabeth is like, nothing's wrong. You're fine. You know, like, everything's fine. They just Elizabeth is her, like, sometimes the gas is more here. But what happens is if someone else turns the gas up in another part, it pulls and it thins the light out and that's normal her confusion regarding this is how we got the term of course today and it's very fascinating how this term is a very common term now like mm -hmm. it's one that like we've come to recognize but i had no can... idea where it came from the term itself is more saturated into culture than the actual stories be it the play yeah. or the british production or this american production mm -hmm. Like, it's all based on this, but it's kind of grown beyond it, even though this is the birth of that term. I never even thought about why it's called that. It's yeah. such a unique term, and everyone knows exactly what you're talking about when you say it. But also, what is the connection? Unless you know this story. I think separate of this story, you almost think of it like someone's, like, guiding you or leading you to something. Or yes, like which... Just Absolutely. using any light, like, yeah. you know, or think of like one of those fish with the like lights out that's drawing prey. Well, and or also, something. like, if you have a gas leak, you can go crazy. Yeah. Right. So there's also that, or it can like affect you in that way, I think. Gaslighting just has the better ring to it. And well, I mean, I and guess. with this story, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, and so every time she asks them if they've turned on gas in a different part of the house, they truly haven't. But here's so she the, doesn't know why. But here's the thing. El El Elizabeth can't hear the noises. No, Elizabeth can't hear, but there's also footsteps coming from above and, where there's not supposed to be anyone. And Nancy's off and off gallivanting. She's going on dates. During these, these times. This is a part of like the thing in which she's starting to question her sanity. But also this 
this dude, his name is Gregory. That's mm-hmm. as played by Charles Boyer. Again, Charles Boyer is actually fucking great. He is movie. really good. He'll do these things like he'll give a brute to her and be like, this was handed down from my grandmother to my mother. And now I want you to have it. And then he'll like pickpocket it off of her. And then, you know, and then she'll realize that she doesn't have it and thinks she lost it, even mm-hmm. though he took it. And he does this with multiple things. To the point where he almost convinces her that the letter that you had described earlier, that she just imagined that. Mm-hmm. And that she made it up. And this movie is relentless. Like, this is the whole movie it going is through this. Like, it is relentless. Look, yeah. I'm way too lazy to be a stalker. Forget this shit. All the amount of effort that this guy has to go through to do it, but he does have a motivation. I'm sure he likes to control, but there is some motivation as we discover through a guy who works for Scotland Yard. Mr. Cotton. Joseph Cotton. He was played for- by Joseph Cotton. His name is Brian. He's very American. He works for he works for Scotland Yard. He recognizes her because she looks like her aunt because he, he her, was a big yeah. fan of her aunt. He didn't know her well. But we find out later that he was the adoring fan that she gave her glove to. She made a real impression on him when he was young. He's about the same age as Paula. And I thought he had kids because at one point there were children with him. But maybe he was just being an uncle and taking them somewhere. But anyway, well, we never he, saw those kids again. He reveals that that the, um, the Antons or whatever, his her aunt had some jewels, like heirloom jewels that... Were given to her by, like, a king of a country or yeah, an emperor Yeah, like, literally or national jewels or something of some yeah. nation. and Because he wants to reopen the case because he's like, something is wrong in that house. And he suspects that those jewels still have not been recovered or found. And he's very intuitive, almost oh, maybe yeah. a little too intuitive because on the surface it's hard to read, but like he just has all of these suspicions. And he I guess it, he's a little obsessed with I it. I guess too. it helped. Well, it makes sense later why he is obsessed because he knew the aunt personally, or at least briefly. Ingrid Bergman does look exactly like her aunt. So, and then this guy comes around and it's just weird because this place is completely empty for so long. And then her lookalike niece and this dude. And he's also taking notice that she never leaves the house. Yeah, she never leaves. There's actually a point where she walks outside and then Nancy says to her, where are you going, miss? And she's like, I'm going to go take a walk. And she goes, well, if your husband comes back, what do you want me to tell him? And she's like, oh, um, I'm not going on a walk. Like, and she goes back in the house. Like, she doesn't, she can't leave alone. When she leaves with him, he embarrasses her because he's, you know, she's lost something or whatever. He gets her to the point where, like you said, she's doubting everything about herself. She genuinely thinks she's crazy now. Yeah, she's she not, thinks she, she can't thinks remember so. everything. He'll tell her. And and as soon as, like, he'll be mean to her. But then when she starts acting as though he's mad and she's sorry, he lightens the mood immediately and is like, it's really fine. It's not like a big deal. Let's go to the party. He's you know? getting her on emotional roller coasters. It's, he's jerking her back and forth and around. And there's like a nail in the coffin situation where this woman that she knew when she was a child invites her to a party and he like, he first tells her they're going to, he tells her they're not going to go. She dresses for it, but he's like, we're not fucking going to that. And then she's like, no, I'm going. And when he realizes, he's like, oh, of course I'm going to go to the party. You don't think that I would let you go without me, would you? When he just said like, well, you're going by yourself. And then this was like the worst thing that he did because it's also the one that is the least possible in that they're, they're sitting down listening to someone play the piano. Mm. And the and Joe, Mr. Cotton is over there watching. Observing. Observing because he's so interested in them. He all of a sudden in the middle of the performance leans over to her and says, my watch is gone. No. She's like, oh goodness. And she looks in her bag or he looks in her bag and the watch is there. So he's positing that she pickpocketed him. Compulsively stole his watch stealing. out of his pocket. But you're a married couple. It it's not make really any sense. stealing, right? But he's like, you did this. And she's like, I don't remember doing it. And then she like starts wailing. Yeah, yeah. She's freaking and he out. He tells everyone, so sorry. I thought she was well, but she's really, really not. We have to go. Yeah. And that was, you're never leaving the house again after this. Ingrid Bergman, 
I've always been a, a kind of an admirer of hers for a long time. Yeah. Her overall look, she has this very soft look, a very beautiful woman. I don't think anyone would deny that. But in the beginning, when we see her genuinely happy, like no one beams like she beams. Mm-hmm. Like she's so convincingly in love when she's portraying that. Like there's something very comforting about her. But she's also, when she feels distraught, when she feels wrecked, when she feels manipulated, she it seems like it ages her a little bit. She's hollowed out. She, she becomes like, it's so easy how she can go from like breathlessly beautiful to, I mean, she's always going to be beautiful, but she's just, she's she's very good at just seeming exhausted and broken at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so you got that contrast here in this movie. I mean, there's a lot of range for her to chew on, even more so than maybe in her more infamous movie, Casablanca, you know? It's such emotional weight that she's physically exhausted. She cannot deal with the back and forth so much that she's literally almost always passing out. Like, she just can't. Because she also thinks she's crazy and she's losing her mind to the point where Mr. Cotton, that's not, no, that's not his name in the movie, Brian, right. eventually gets into the house. I don't cotton to that. He gets into the house and he talks to her and she's like, you can't be here. And she says something about how she's crazy. And he's like, if you will listen to me, I'm going to prove to you that you're not. Mm-hmm. And then the gaslight happens and the footsteps. And he's like, I see it. I hear it. And she's like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's the first time she's had acknowledgement that so- she can hear footsteps. She takes him into her husband's study and he busts open the desk. She's like, no, don't. But he does and sees all this sh- that letter. Meanwhile, he has also Should've placed destroyed the letter. a constable on that street to chat up Nancy and also keep an eye out for him for anything awkward. So they've noticed that the man will leave at night and then seemingly disappear and then come back hours and hours later dirty. Mm. Like he's been digging up stuff and they don't know what's going on. So the console is kind of watching and the man is also like trying to get inside and they finally do. And, you know, he they bust up in the desk and she shows him the letter. That she thought she was told was she imagined. And he has this note in his pocket that he's saved because he's a detective and he's trying to put all the pieces together as very little things of hers and related to her. So he kept this letter where her husband had declined that party originally, right? And basically he ended up with it because the woman throwing the party was like, oh yeah, I'm sorry, they're not going to be here. See the letter? And he just kept pocketed it. Mm -hmm. So he has that letter and compares it to the letter... From before her aunt was murdered. The handwriting is the same. Handwriting is the same. He figures out that her husband has been climbing into the upstairs window of an empty house or breaking into an empty house, climbing up, going over the roof into their attic and digging through the aunt's In the upstairs where they night boarded off. after night looking for the jewels. And he's a man named Sergis Bauer. Yes. Who Killed. is married yeah, yeah. Somewhere. And also killed her fucking aunt. And killed aunt. her fucking aunt. But now, so. Her aunt was probably very sweet. They're waiting for him to come back, but he, that's when he decides because he's been looking for these jewels. Finds them. For like a couple of months at least here, right? This guy's been, every night in which Nancy's out on dates, this guy is ransacking this upstairs mm-hmm. and he finally finds the jewels embedded in the dress that the aunt is wearing in the picture. And it's so great because. When the detective puts it all together at the end, I love the idea. I feel like her aunt was the femme fatale, right? So he, I love the idea that this very important, powerful man gave her these jewels uh-huh. and she had them embossed into the dress that she sang in front of him wearing. It yeah. was like their little secret. Right. You know, like maybe they were having an affair. Who knows? Because this guy obviously was obsessed with her also, in addition to wanting the jewels. He doesn't go back the way he came. Mm -mm. He goes through the barricade. Well, which is a door. The barricade has hinges on it, so he opens the door and just pushes the barricade. That's like such a play thing to do. That's like such like it's a fucking screen door. That was ridiculous. But he's got his jewels, so he doesn't really have much reason to stick around. So he's. A little more mask off. Oh, and now. Brian has left already because he's gone around the outside. But he's waiting outside, and Elizabeth does go to get him. But they have this confrontation, and Brian does come back, and that is his name. Yes, Brian Cameron Joseph Cotton. She starts talking about like, oh, there was a man here, but like I must have just. She's like clowning him now. Like there was a man here, but you know 
he was just a figment of my imagination. He opened up your desk there because he sees that his well, desk was open. He kind of makes her, he's got, he's so in her head that for a second, she does believe it again because he's like, he actually looks at Elizabeth and he's like, Elizabeth, was there a man here? And Elizabeth's like, no, sir. Yeah, there was yeah. no man. Cause Elizabeth knows yeah. that she can't let him know until she goes and gets the man. So right. she did go get the man. And bring him back so in, and Joe then he shows up the door like he's like, "Yeah, I'm like a phantom, I'm I like am a, a ghost, yeah. I'm a figment of her imagination." <laughs> so they go, they you hear Joseph Cotton and um the constable and Charles Boyer like going at it in the space that was barricaded yeah, off, attic. and she comes in and he's tied up, so she asks her time alone, and he's like, "Come on, you can untie me." She's like. And she's like, and she finds the brooch that that he said was his mother's and shit, and she's like. Oh, I'm just too crazy to untie you. I, I don't. Knife. I don't it's know. A knife. She, I'm just. And yeah, she's holding a she knife. She gets this knife and she goes. There's no knife here. Yes, I put it there. Look I for don't it. see any knife. I put it there tonight. No, it isn't here. You must have dreamed you put it there. Are you suggesting that this is a knife I hold in my hand? Have you gone mad, my husband? Or is it I who am mad? Yes, of course. That's it. Is this a knife? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what this is. <laughs> and then she just like drops it. Yeah, it's just, it's so good. And she calls the cops to come in and take him away. And that's the end of the movie. She's a tragic figure. But at least she gets her groove back at the and end. And hopefully she and Mr. Brian get it on. Brian had the other glove that her aunt had. Oh, and that's how he gained her trust. And that's like, look, you and, yeah. the, and they had it on display, the other glove, and it was like, see, I knew her. I admired her. And uh, it, it kind of does imply that they're probably going to, like, hook up. Gaslight. That's where the term came from, is this movie. This woman in crisis, this Ingrid Bergman. Yeah. We saw a lot of men, women lose their mind, and this appears to be that but no, she didn't lose her mind. It was just a emotionally abusive husband who was played with great villainy by Charles Boyer. He really did stand out here. He was so fun to this despise. This movie makes your skin crawl. Yeah. It yeah. made my skin crawl. But there are some aspects of it that are like a little funny at the same time. Absolutely. I do love the the hinged uh, barricade. But this was a play, and you said that's very play-like, so it makes sense. I yeah, it, feel, it feels very like stagecrafty. So we're going to give it one through five each, combined for best out of ten. Floating around the four, I'm going to give it a 3.75. Hmm. I'm going to give it a 4.5. So that is an 8.25 for Gaslight by George Cukor from 1944. I imagine this can hit home for a lot of women. Yeah. So check it out. Not many are at the 8.25. We have uh, Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid. We gave it an 8.25. We gave it a higher uh, score than Oppenheimer and Killers of the Flower Moon. You did. I think you gave it. I stand by it. (laughs) It's in the same league as Hot Shots. Oh, God. It happened on Fifth Avenue, Mad God, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Gaslight is at least as good, if not better. Better. Than those movies. It's better than those movies. Better than Hot Shots? Come on. Yes. That's controversial. The only one that's in league is Fifth Avenue. It's not better than Hot Shots, okay? It's lucky to share the room with Hot Shots. All right? Anyway. Check the show notes for links, other places to find us. Like, subscribe. We enjoy it when you like and subscribe. Uh, throw some stars for the pod listeners. Spotify, Apple Podcasts. If you listen on those, star that shit. It helps us out. Leave a comment, correction, uh, fun fact. What we say when we say goodbye for our women in crisis. Watch your back, girl. <laughs> Oh, my God.